Welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, this is James, and welcome to the podcast. And this week, we thought it might be nice to have Mad in America founder Robert Whittaker with us to answer your questions. Thank you to all of you who took the time and trouble to get in touch. You sent some great questions. And so on this and our next podcast, we'll be talking with Bob about Mad in America, the biopsychosocial model, the history of psychiatry, pharmaceutical marketing, and issues with psychiatric treatments, including psychiatric drugs and electroconvulsive therapy. So on to part one of the discussion now, and we'll hear more from Bob on the next podcast later in December. Bob, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me again for the Madden America podcast, and also to spend a bit of time this time answering reader and listener questions, which uh, people have helpfully sent in. So firstly, welcome. It's good to have you on. And it's nice to be here again. Thanks for Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, to uh, get underway, the, the kind of first batch of questions really are, are kind of around the theme of, of Madden America itself. So Karina sent in the first question. Karina is someone you know, and she's asked, could you tell us how MIA got started and what your role was in, in getting it underway? So after I published Anatomy of an Epidemic, um, I began hearing from people who really wanted to sort of talk about what it meant to the, for them, and both from people with lived experience and, and prescribers, actually. Now, at that time, I already had a personal blog, uh, because Mad in America was my first book, and so I had a, a blog related to that. And so I began just running their blogs on my personal blog. And then it became obvious that really it would be really helpful to have a website that did several things, provided a forum for people with lived experience to talk about their experiences, to provide a forum for people just to write about what were their thoughts about how we might change psychiatry, prescribers, family members, activists, that sort of thing. And then three, of course, is if you look at anatomy of an epidemic, it's really a story about how we as a society have organized ourselves around a false narrative, a false narrative of science. And so one of the key things in, toward, in terms of reforming psychiatry or rethinking psychiatry is to provide the actual research to the community, to the public, about what is known about drugs, what is known about the validity of diagnoses and that sort of thing. So it became evident that it would be really useful to have a website that provided those three things, a forum for stories of personal experiencing, a story for blogs, and research news. And I had known Kermit Cole uh, at, ever since I published Mad in America, the book. Louisa Putnam wrote me after Anatomy of an Epidemic was published with some questions. So the three of us got together and said, let's start a website. And it really was founded by us three. It was a joint project. And the three of us launched it in January of 2012. Looking back now, Bobby, are you... Are you surprised with the way that Madden America has grown over that time? When you started out this website, what was your vision for it at the time? How did you see it growing? You know, I didn't really see it growing. And the vision, we, there wasn't a long range vision. It was sort of a need at the time with those three elements in mind and, and really nothing more than that. And we started it, by the way, uh, as an all volunteer organization. Everybody was putting in their time. And I don't think we really had any or I had any vision of what it might turn into with this sort of a you know, number of people contributing, all the different elements we have. The only thing I can say is, from the beginning, there was a sense that we would be very agile or open-minded to new possibilities, precisely because there wasn't a, a, a real vision for how to expand it. It was just, let's, let's see how this goes and let's see what we can build. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, on a similar theme, an anonymous question here. So Madden America has been going for 10 years. Can it keep going for another 10? Putting this in context, is there was from the beginning the sense that we would be an alternative media, okay? Because the, the mainstream media just is, is not a reliable narrative of the actual science, okay? And that's what we've become. That's not what we were in the beginning. We were much smaller, but we really are now serving as an alternative media. You can't find what's on Madden America anywhere else on, uh, on the web in terms of the information about drugs, research, news, and the variety of, of opinions, personal stories, et cetera. So 
we're actually now, what, 11 years in? And I think we occupy a very important place, not just in the United States, but globally across countries in terms of helping society rethink of possibilities and, and consider other possibilities and do so in an evidence-based manner. So I think it's important that we do continue. However, I will tell you, there are challenges. And the biggest challenge is financial, frankly. And right now, as you know, we're hitting a bit of a crisis. We're just, we've expanded to a place that far outstrips our donations. So we have to make, we have to rethink how are we going to keep on funding this? So I can imagine it keeping on going another 10 years, but we now have this very real challenge. How do we fund an alternative media that can't tap into the, any of the usual sources for, for funding, even grant sources? Because grants go to, by and large, those that are sort of close to the mainstream idea. So, yes, I can imagine us uh, staying alive for another 10 years. Yes, I hope we'll stay alive for number, another 10 years, but it's not easy being an alternative media uh, you know, finding the funding to do what we do. So, James, one of the things we're considering now is adopting a subscription model. And under the subscription model, what will happen is we'll have some, some of our content, or in order to read it all, some of the resources, some of the science news, in order to read the complete article, you're going to have to subscribe. Now, under this subscription proposal, you know, it'll be a, a minor fee, like $5 a month, maybe $40 a year, and we'll provide some other benefits like free access to events and all. And we will include a free option. So if anyone can afford that, they can write us and we'll set them up as, as a subscriber in that way. So what we want to do is make sure that everyone, no matter what their resources, will have access, full access to all our content. And then basically what we're going to be doing is asking people who can afford $5 a month, which isn't a, a, a large amount, to support us in this way. And, and I'm hoping this, this, will, this will provide a solid way for going forward with our revenues. We've been a free, ad-free site now for 12 years. Not a single ad, nothing like that. We want to keep it ad-free. That preserves the reading experience. Um, so that, that's the goal. And now, you know, James, this year we're going to have, as you know, something like 6 million uh, unique visits to, to our site. So hopefully we can convert the, you know, those visits into a nice, a solid subscri subscription base. And by the way, if we do that, we should have resources to continue to expand our efforts, our original journalism, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you, Bob. And um, another an anonymous question here. Are, are you ever worried that Madden America's reporting and blogs might cause harm? And, to, you know, to give a little bit of context here, uh, a few weeks ago, Alan Francis on X now, used to be Twitter, made a claim that Ma uh, Madden America advises people to go off their drugs, which is, of course, it, it is not true. But that's one example, I guess, where someone used social media to try and cast aspersions on what Madden America does. This was a claim that, that was, was used to shut us down right from the beginning. When I published uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic, which was a book that told of when you look at the long-term effects of psychiatric medications, you see a form of treatment that worsens aggregate, in, uh, aggregate outcomes. You see that people are more likely to become chronically ill with long-term use and functionally impaired. Now, the very first review that was published, five minutes after the pub date, <laughs> accused me of doing great harm with this book, that this book would do great harm. And they likened me to a South African dictator who, by virtue of denying AIDS, had caused hundreds of thousands of people to die. So this book was positioned as a harmful book right from the beginning. And after that review ran, by the way, in my hometown, Boston Globe new newspaper, that's a great thing to see in your morning newspaper. I had radio interviews canceled, and frankly, no other major newspaper reviewed the book. So that's a charge that's been used to shut us down all the way, okay? And the thought is it will cause people to go off their medications and, do, and that will lead to harm for some. Now, we do know that going off drugs can be very risky. That's a function of being on the drugs in the first place, more than, the more than due to the disorder. But what's our job and what does society really need? Society needs informed consent around the use of these drugs. So the harm that has been done is by a profession that doesn't provide informed consent and a media that doesn't dig, doesn't 
go back into the research literature and see what the research literature actually says. That's the harm being done because that has led to a misunderstanding of what the drugs do. That has led to many, many, many people being on the drugs long-term, even when clearly that, you know, short-term use would be much better or even, you know, trying to forego initial use. So you have to go back to the initial source of harm. And by the way, all the data says that with this new disease model of care, the burden of mental disorders has gone up. Outcomes have worsened. That's a story of great public harm. So unfortunately, what is needed is an alternative media that provides informed consent. And that means providing information about what drugs do and what are short-term effects, what are long-term effects. And that's what we provide. Now, I will say I've heard from, we've heard from so, so, so many people who say this information has given them a new life, a new understanding of what happened to them, and they took a different course. So that's a story of actually great benefit from informed consent. And then you go to, do we advise people to go off drugs? Never, ever, ever, ever. In fact, if you read Mad in America, it tells you how perilous, how difficult it can be once you're on these drugs to go off the drugs and that you may experience difficult withdrawal effects. And we're very honest saying that we don't even know if the brain resets itself for everyone. So all that is informed consent. So we never advocate for any, any mode of action, any mode of therapeutic action. We're just trying to give people the information they need to make informed decisions. And anybody who now, like Alan Francis or others, say we're harming people, you just have to say to yourself, oh, these people do not believe in informed consent. They believe in people being uh, information kept from them so they will keep on taking their drugs. Perfect. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and so next, uh, another anonymous one. Um, Madden America's mission is to serve as a catalyst to rethinking psychiatric care in the United States and abroad. What would need to happen for you to consider that mission fulfilled? In a way, I think the mission is, is happening. The fulfilling of the mission is happening. If you go back 12 years ago and look at the narrative that was spreading throughout the internet and to other sites and even into mainstream media, it was very different. The chemical imbalance story was still alive then. The disease model was still alive there. There was very little talk about in the, in the public media about withdrawal effects. There was very little talk about how, in essence, the whole disease model narrative had fallen apart. Now, here we are 12 years later, and there's, there's increasing discussion about withdrawal effects. There's an acknowledgement, even within the profession, that the disorders lack, the diagnostic categories lack validity. There's even admission now that uh, there has been no in improvement in outcomes. Now, they don't want to say that outcomes have worsened in the last 40 years, but there's that acknowledgement. And then there are calls for radical change coming from the top. And I'm speaking specifically of the, when, the, when Danius Purris was the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Health. He made these calls, and it was a call that was basically consonant with what we have, in essence, been advocating through our reporting. And of course, now the World Health Organization has twice now issued new documents, 300 pages in length, saying we need a radical change away from the disease model and toward this human rights model, one that recognizes that you know, there are social determinants of health. Disorders don't just occur with inside the individual, but in the in-between spaces and how society organizes itself. These are all themes that, that's a new narrative. And these are all themes that we have been, been advocating for a long time. Now, the question is, will the mission, mission ever be done? Even as these calls for a new narrative have come forth, and even as they're gaining sort of a foundation in the general public, the, the form of care hasn't changed. Forced treatment is on the increase. It's still basically drugs, 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 drugs. It's still sort of marketing stories that you need these drugs. So. There's a sense that I think in order for the mission to be accomplished, you'd have to have a new storyteller, not psychiatry as the storyteller, as, a, as you know, ha having authority over this domain quote of medicine. You'd have to have a larger sort of uh, group recognized by society as the storytellers for the narrative we should follow. And is that going to happen? I don't know. You know, medical authorities have a lot of established authority in our society. And it's really hard to 
put them to this side and say, these people shouldn't really have authority over uh, uh, this section of our lives. But if we have a totally new narrative in 10 years, maybe personally I'll say mission accomplished and we'll figure out what to do at that time. Okay, a, a couple of others on Madden America and its work before we kind of move on. So um, this next question is perhaps a little bit about more about working with others. So this is from Mary, who says, some campaign groups have legislative efforts and track laws and regulations, other groups lobby. Are there any ways that MIA could play more of an advocacy and change agent role? And is there any effort to join forces with others? Yeah, this is a good question and an important question. So we are um, an activist form of journalism because, as you see in our mission statement, we do see a need to change the narrative, okay? So there's an activism present in that. But we see our role as serving as a journalistic alternative media to, you know, serve that mission best. And in order to retain our sort of journalistic um, sense, there's two things. We can't lobby for anything. By the way, as a nonprofit now, we're not allowed to lobby for anything. But we also don't actually join forces with anyone else. So, for example, um, as, as you know, I had a role in even founding IAPW, the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. But, and, you know, now uh, I, I'm not one of the uh, board members or anything on that. And this is part of the reason is... We can, we can promote what they're doing. In other words, we can serve as a forum for them announcing what they're doing and as a forum for, obviously, whatever research they come up with. But we don't join with them in setting forth an agenda. And we, don't, we won't join forces with anyone in terms of setting agenda. So we need this editorial independence saying, here's our job. We're an alternative media. We're not a lobbyist organization. But we will report on lobbying efforts, okay? In other words, if there's groups trying to lobby, uh, and we'll let people even talk about their lobbying efforts or the, uh, on blogs, et cetera. We're a forum for change, but within a journalistic context. This question's from Tara, and it, it's, about, it's about something specific. So why are readers of Madden America welcome to share our stories and concerns about psychiatry, but we are shut down if we try to discuss the similar shortcomings of AA-style 12-step programs? Well, I'm not sure I know why uh, Tara uh, feels, feels shut down on this issue. In terms of personal stories... Uh, you know, we let people talk about what's been harmful to them and, and what's been helpful to them. And for example, I'm sure people have talked about help coming from 12 steps and if people found it um, harmful and, you know, it's a personal story that's well written and all, I don't, I don't believe we wouldn't uh, include that. So there's nothing saying that criticism of 12 steps is off limits. In fact, we have a sense that criticism of any type of therapy is not, is not off limits. So, you know, this person can write me personally, but there's no sense that Mad in America wouldn't uh, publish a story by an indiv- a personal story by someone who's, you know, had an unfortunate experience or a harmful experience with 12 steps. Thank you for that clarification, Bob. Okay, so I mean, I guess a little bit moving on to look towards the future then. So um, this question's from Lynn who says, I would like to know why you think we've not seen a multidisciplinary approach to solving the problem of so-called mental illness. Why is there seemingly no or little interest in the areas of soft psychology, philosophy, sociology, religion, history, and even literature and the arts? So great question. And often when I you know, am asked to give a talk and I ask what we should do, I, sh- I think we need a rethinking that involves all those things, philosophers and understanding of history, an understanding of literature and arts, because that's two things happen when you broaden into this multidisciplinary understanding. When you get a different vision of what it means to be human than is, than is present in the di- Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And of course, the image you get of humans is that we're very emotional creatures. We have difficult times, grieve, you know, we have ups and downs. And it's not like we're in control of our emotions all the time. And even psychosis can be seen as, you know, Psychosis mania is part of the human condition. So when she asked this, I couldn't agree more that this is sort of the approach that we need to embrace or incorporate into a narrative. I keep talking about a narrative. Now, there are people writing from philosophical perspectives, sociological perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. 
religious perspectives. So there are writings from those perspectives, sociological perspectives, and in many ways they 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 do gather into a call for understanding quote the so- social determinants of health too. So under the, our current disease model put forth by the uh, American Psychiatric Association with its DSM, problems arise within the head. There's something wrong with your chemistry, something wrong within the individual. When we look out into these this multidisciplinary approach and we talk about the social de- determinants of health, we're talking about things like food, exercise, uh, shelter, equality, and all the things that, in, you know, that we know, we're talking about environments because we actually know that human beings are responsive to their environments. And we're talking about creating better environments that are, m- are more socially engaging, all these things that help people stay well. So that information is out there. <laughs> Now this person is asking, why isn't that story incorporated into the mainstream narrative of the disease model? Because, very simply, the disease model was invented by the American Psychiatric Association because that was a model that gave it authority over this domain of our lives. That's number one. Number two, that was a model that turned them into medical doctors in white coats. And that's that's an image, a branding that has great value. And also, of course, it's now if if the problem's inside your head, and I'm a medical doctor, prescribing drugs is going to be the go-to thing. Now, who loves that? The drug companies. They love that model. The drug companies can't can't sell a drug to like uh, provide shelter. They can't provide a drug that provides food, nutrition, exercise, socialization. They need it to be focused in located inside the head. So you have these two strong forces. A medical discipline, a medical guild who wants to maintain this a, a disease model, pharmaceutical money uh, pour, pouring into it. And finally, there is a larger medical uh, uh, foundation for this or, or, or a reason for this. And that is, for the last 70 years, at least in Western, Western medicine, we have been prompted, I mean, we, the public, to go to our doctors and expect a pill for every ill. That's one of the things that we've been taught. So it also feeds into this idea there are magic bullets out there. They can make us better than well, for, or better than, you know, they can alleviate all sorts of problems. So we as a public have been conditioned to think pills have the answer. So you add those three, conditioning, medical discipline, and, and pharmaceutical monies. That's a powerful coalition that maintains this disease model, even as it is seen as failing, even as it is seen as not evidence-based even as it is seen as being harm done, and even as if you ask the public, what do you really believe? They'll move to the sociological, philosophical narrative in a second. Yeah, absolutely. And while you were talking, Bob, I couldn't help but think about the articles that we share from our global partners, so the Mad Mad in the World global sites, who often write about these and apply their own cultural lens, which is very, very different from the Western-centric lens, isn't it? And they're often talking about it in a much less medicalized way. And it's fascinating to see how different that can be when a different cultural lens is applied. Yeah, this is one of the things, one of the things in terms of our growth that has been so important. We now have 50, 15 affiliated websites in 15 other countries. We ha- they come from Mexico, you know, they come from Latin America, they come from Europe, and they- now we have one in Mad in South Asia. First of all, you have to say, why are these affiliate sites springing up? It's because the, the disease model is failing in every country, and there was a globalization of that disease model. The DSM was promoted, you know, not just through Europe, but to Latin America, to Asia, et cetera. So there is this growing grassroots resistance. But the other thing goes exactly to what you're saying. We can learn from each other. We can learn from what they're doing in India. We can learn from what they're doing in Norway. We can learn from what they're doing in Brazil. So the sharing of information across our affiliate sites, across cultures, is a way to give readers insight into the many possibilities for rethinking these things and and seeing how other cultures have done it, what they're doing, take inspiration from them, learn from them, and that's one of the things that Madden in America is now providing. And one of our real initiatives in the coming year is to further this sort of exchange of information among all sites, meaning sort of information from Madden in America, particularly our research news to all the global affiliates, and 
and among the global affiliates and back to us, information about what's going on in their countries, what initiatives are happening. So one of the things Matt in South Asia is working on right now is looking at the long history of traditional practices for treating psychosis in India, which is of great interest because when the World Health Organization did a study of schizophrenia outcomes, where did they find the best outcomes in the world? Rural India that actually still was practicing these sort of practices. So that's an example of what we can learn from this this Mad in the World uh, network. Okay, and um, a question from DB, who's asking about the biopsychosocial model. So they say psychiatry insists it practices a biopsychosocial model and so often expects the public to accept that as a given. But do patients report the same? Has there ever been a big study on psychiatric patients ranking the emphasis placed on bio slash psycho slash social in their experiences of psychiatric treatment? So the biopsychosocial is basically a branding me- message from psychiatry. They, they, it's a way for them to say, oh, we're not just pill prescribers. So as much as anything, it's something they say to themselves to, to feel good about what they do, because obviously they know that there are psychological aspects and social aspects. But really, going back to the 80s, they started calling themselves psychopharmacologists. So as they said, really, we're going to be in the we're going to be prescribers of pills, and we'll leave these other stuff to psychologists, et cetera. Now, there's been, I think there have been studies going back about uh, what percentage of people were told they had a chemical imbalance, even after within the research field that had been abandoned, say, a, a problem with their serotonin. Um, and you can certainly see that there have been surveys about how people have been treated, and not just in the United States, but certainly throughout Western countries. When they've come to, even starting with their GP, even before they hit a psychiatrist, it's been very much a disease model that has dominated. And in fact, if you listen to patient experiences, they over and over again tell about how there's little interest in their psychology, little interest in social issues, and little support for even exploring them. And of course, in the United States, you get like 15 minutes with your psychiatrist, so they're basically pill pill reviews. And I think there have been some surveys um, that have documented this. Now, in terms of going forward, you could do a documentation, a survey, a study about, is it still a disease model? I presume people, psychiatrists, are getting away from the chemical imbalance story since it's become sort of a source of embarrassment for the field internationally. When I was in Brazil last week and given a talk, a psychiatrist stood up and said, yes, we've known that this, there was no chemical imbalance for, for years, and we shouldn't be saying this. So I'm not sure if, I mean, it would be interesting to see if people are still saying it. I, I sort of think that it is now passe and uh, has been discredited, but I guarantee you, there's still pills as the first form of treatment. That's what they're focusing on, and they're still saying these pills are good for you, and maybe we don't know how they work, but they work. Okay, and a question from Larry, who says, has your work resulted in any kind of a vision for what mental health care in America or across, or across the world could become if it were really devoted to making people well? How would it finance itself? What range of practitioners would it include? What range of treatments would they use? What benefits to society might accrue? Well, if we go back to that earlier question, James, about if we organize ourselves around a narrative, that one, a narrative that did incorporate our understanding of human beings through literature, art, religious tracts, et cetera. And we also understood that there are social determinants of health. In other words, environments matter. Then, of course, we would have to do a couple things if we are able to organize ourselves around that. One, if someone was in distress, we'd have to think about how can we improve their environment? In what way can we provide support? But even beyond that, you'd have to say as a society, how do we better organize ourselves as a society to nurture the, the health of our citizens? And it might be in terms of helping them engage socially, find meaning in life, better equality, better housing, better food, better exercise, et cetera. So first of all, will we, I think the question is, will we ever have that, right? I don't know, James. I mean, in terms, of, uh, in terms of society rethinking itself, you know, capitalism is a powerful force. And capitalism really is about making money and providing opportunities for funneling money into 
you know, certain people in, in positions of economic, you know, authority, so to speak, or, you know, that have companies or whatever it might be. So I, I, there is a sense our economic system is at odds with an organization, a society that nurtures mental health. So you're asking me, are we going to get rid of capitalism? I, I don't think so. And that also goes to this question of financing it. Our current system generates huge profits, of course. And it is, oddly enough, though, largely funded by the government. So, for example, in the United States, if you look at spending on psychiatric drugs, about 60% of it, 60 to 65%, is funded by the, the American government through Medicaid and Medicare. Now, the rest is mostly funded through uh, uh, you know, health insurance that people are paying for. So the problem is, how do you finance a thing where you're not making a profit from it? Um, now, if you could have a government that said, okay, let's fund respite houses or well, let's fund medication free care and let's do so because it'll save us money in the long term. I mean, that would be great. Okay. And then you can make an economic argument for that. Like, so example, if you can have this sort of good care right from the beginning that uh, focuses also on psychological and social determinants of health. And help people get back on track and not become chronic mental patients. That's a great savings, right? If you look at our spending in the United States, government spending on, on, on mental health care since 1980, it has soared many, many, many fold since they adopted this disease model. So from a spending point of view, you can make an argument we need to rethink this disease model of care. And I think that's actually the best argument in terms of for really change that could be made to legislators. This is a failure. It's an expensive failure. If you want to cut your, your government spending on mental health, look about providing these larger sort of holistic uh, care right from the beginning. Look at exercise, et cetera, and that'll save you money in the long run. Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. And this question from Laurie is, is kind of a, along similar lines. And Laurie says, do you honestly think psychiatry could ever change to become an industry that truly helps people and society as a whole? Yeah, you know, here's the problem is psychiatry today, you know, to become a psychiatrist, you go through medical school. So you adopt a medical thinking and you I, adopt a medical identity. And you've invested in that. Now, you, you can want to help people, okay? You can be a very caring person and go through that process, and you can choose psychiatry for that reason, because you want to help people, and you want to help them get their lives back. The problem is, and again, I keep going back to this narrative, it's not just a medical problem. It's sort of a whole living problem. So what psychiatry would have to do is, like, would have to say rethink itself rather than have authority over this domain of our lives be the one that determines things could they become part of a larger you know multidisciplinary way of thinking about this way of categorizing this way of responding to that which means they'd have to give up their their position at the as the leader of this whole story because they're right now as the medical specialty they're on top of this whole pyramid we talked about of psychologists, sociologists, religion, et cetera. They're at the top. They're the ones that when the media calls up someone, they call up psychiatrists for this. So will they give up that power, that domain, that authority, that sense of self? That's really tough. It's tough for people who see themselves as a medical training and go through medical training, not to see themselves as the top of that perch. So it's going to be difficult, okay? You know, we have a younger generation coming through that is more humble about being a doctor, I think, than before. More aware, sort of, of the, a need for humility. You know, there's more women doctors coming through now than in the United States. So that old image of the male doctor, know, know all, is, is diminishing. And I, I, I hope I don't get in trouble with this, but sometimes I think um, the younger generation and also women professionals are more willing to share power. So could we move to a place where psychiatry sees itself as a part of a power-sharing arrangement? That's the hope. And the hope is also that they will develop a humility. Now, medicine is about saying, we know, we're learning, we believe in the progress of medicine. 
And the thing that we've learned about mental disorders is the brain, of course, is so, so, so complex and mysterious. And of course, the brain is attached to the body, that sort of thing. So you have to have a, a humility about like, what's going on with people who are depressed? What's going on with when they're ma manic? What's going on when they're psychosis? And that humility so often says, we don't know what's going on. And therefore, we have to be open to saying there might be a lot of different approaches. So remember, medical training is about saying we know. Psychiatry needs to adopt this position of humility saying we don't know. And how can we join with others in, in creating this sort of holistic system? It's a big ask. But that's the hope. So once again, thank you so much for all of your excellent questions. And in the next part of the discussion, we'll hear Bob's thoughts on the history of psychiatry, pharmaceutical marketing, and issues with psychiatric treatments. So please do come and join us. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. For more news, views, and updates, visit maddenamerica.com.